today I'm thrilled to introduce, or rather to greet, uh, Jane Burbank. We all know Jane. Jane worked in uh, the University of Michigan since 18, uh, since, oh, I'm sorry, <laughs> I, I'm sorry. Uh, I'm, a nine, I'm a 19th century specialist. <laughs> since 1987 to 2001, right? And um, now Jane is in uh, NYU, uh, collegiate professor in NYU, professor of history and Russian and Slavic studies. Um, Jane is the author of a number of important works. She is one of the most prolific historians of Russia. Um, her most recent book is written with Fred Cooper, and um, it's Empire in World History, Power and Politics of Difference. It was published last year, right? Um, <coughs> Jane also, in, two, in 2004, Jane published a book, uh, Russian Peasants Go to Court, about legal culture in Russian countryside. And also, her first book was uh, Intelligence and Revolution, right? It was published in 19, uh, now I'm right, 1986. Um, I also value a lot the books uh, Jane edited on the Russian Empire, on Rus on the uh, on uh, various aspects of Russian history. So we are really thrilled to greet Jane again in this uh, in this uh, room. And actually, Jane served as a director of Greece for many years. So w let uh, please join me welcoming Jane. Well, it's exhilarating and a little intimidating to return to Ann Arbor uh, to present in front of my old colleagues and friends, uh, to return to what we used to call Crease, I'm never sure, we always change names, uh, to the International Institute, to the Weiser Center, to Michigan for this talk. And I want to express my gratitude, first of all, to my hosts, um, to Olga Mayorova, to Ron Suni, to Val Kivelson, uh, to Marisha Ostefan, and Nicole Hausen at Crease. I also want to indulge in a bit of memory and uh, to set a record straight. Part of my talk um, is based on the book I wrote with Fred Cooper. Um, I was invited to speak about this book, and the book is entitled uh, empires in world history, power and the politics of difference. This book came out in uh, 2010. You know, we historians all have troubles with decades and <laughs> centuries, right? 2010. Uh, after uh, Fred and I had been teaching at NYU for eight years. But I want to tell this audience, as I've been telling audiences around the world, uh, that th this book began in Ann Arbor uh, with an international seminar that Fred and I taught under the auspices and with the support of the International Institute when it was quite young. Uh, in the year, the seminar was in the year 1999-2000, what I like to think of as the good turn of the century year. And here's one of the posters from that old seminar, just to back this up. And this uh, Michigan Sawyer International Seminar uh, profoundly shaped uh, Fred's and my thinking about the history of empires. It was the beginning of years of teaching, of writing, of reflection, of argument and revision uh, that ultimately produced uh, our book on empires. So I want to start by saying thanks again to Michigan, where I always say all the good intellectual things happen first. <laughs> so now let's uh, turn to our topic for today, normalizing Russia. Has it ever seemed strange to you that the biggest country in the world today, and for many centuries in the past, 
is considered an outlier, an aberration, uh, maybe a rogue, uh, but definitely not a normal state. After all, the territory of today's Russian Federation, even cut down from its Soviet size, covers a large part of the globe, one-eighth of its inhabited land area. It stretches across an area that we think of as two continents, nine time zones recently reduced from 11. It is inhabited by 143 million people of 182 ethnicities. I'm using the categories of the Russian census. The Russian Federation is the ninth most populous state in the world. Well, of course, we don't judge normality by numbers, by the size of territory or population. As for population, if we took a democratic standard for normality, demos, the population of a state, and we looked at the states with the most people, then China and India together, 37% of the world's population, would be our models. If we judged by the most populous region rather than by states, Asia, 60% would be our new normal. If we took another approach and tried to find an average rather than the most populated state, our normal country would have a population of 5.4 million. Slovakia and Kyrgyzstan, numbers 112 and 113 in population among the world's 225 states, would set our standards. Or to use an average size for normal, we'd have to look at Malawi, 45,000 square miles, to find a normal state. But clearly that's not the way we think about normality. Normal means many things, but most of them, in our language, applies, implies a relation to a standard, a social or a physical norm, an accepted and usually positive attribute. C'est normal, say the French, if you think, if, if you ask them for a favor, they, they should do such favors. Someone's temperature should be normal, like that of a healthy person. I can't resist a joke from last summer in Kazan during the heat wave where I was working. The question was, Kakjila, how are things going? And the response was, Remalna, Tritsa Chest. Normally, 36 degrees, the Celsius equivalent of Fahrenheit temperature, um, 98.6, normal, 98.6. So let's move on to trickier ground. For both social science and everyday speech, normal refers to what is thought to be a conventional way of doing things or being. Normal behavior, normal legal process, normal diplomatic relations. As in this article from last Friday's New York Times, I quote, Nicole Bacheran, a French historian and so political scientist in Paris, observes that, quote, doing away with the death penalty is, her quote, seen as an established norm of modern society. Russian peasants, I wrote about in my book on township courts uh, in the early 20th century, used normal in this way, referring to normal as expected and established kinds of behavior. Here I quote from a court judgment from a peasant court. The township court having considered the circumstances of the present case, finds that the peasant of village Yagunina, Simeon Stepanov Sherbakov, conducts a normal, a normal way of life, and therefore decides to remove the guardianship from him and to free his property from sequestration and distraint. So a normal way of life meant, in this case, economic responsibility. In the words of Sherbakov's wife and witnesses, he now behaved independently, fully economically. That's not so different from what we mean when we say, uh, when we say normal to refer to our own sense of what is standard or proper, uh, a normal person, a normal state. The standard is our own, although we may think that other people adhere to us, to it. 
Well, many of you have spent time in Russia or other parts of Soviet or post-Soviet space will recognize another kind of normal. This normal is something that's not happening. The working term in Russia is nienormalna. At the совершенно nienormalna, this is something, this is completely not normal. Or разве это нормально? Really, is that normal? You think that's normal? Uh, the point that is often made is that whatever is going on is substandard, incorrect, a violation of some kind of criterion. And more often or not than not, the point of reference, the idea of normal, has nothing to do with ordinary, ongoing life in Russia, but with an imagined space of normality, where things are done differently and better. Normality happens elsewhere. Now that elsewhere, for many educated Russians, for over two centuries, has been Europe, with its offshoot, the United States. Russian elites' fixation on comparisons with Europe and with the, its ways from the late 18th century is not surprising. In the 18th century and the 19th, Western European powers, particularly Great Britain, France, later Germany, attained a hegemonic position in the world economy. European products, European art, European education, European political ideas, European styles, became the standards by which elites around the world measured their well-being and their sophistication. In the 20th century, as the United States moved into first place among the capitalist powers, and Soviet communism cut off closer knowledge of the enemy, Soviet elites sustained and even amplified their infatuation with the West. Our common European home became the official slo an official slogan under Gorbachev. Here's a stamp from that time. So the idea that the West set the standards for normal human behavior was a mobilizing slogan in the tough times of the late Soviet state. But I want to focus on what happened next when, after the collapse of communism, scholars in the West and elsewhere were freed from the divisions of the communist period and could think about Russia in less politicized, more open-ended, open-minded ways. Why is it that Russia still figures as an aberration, at best a mystery, Churchill's old formula comes to mind, or at worst, a perversely deviant state. Why is it that we find this sta statement so intriguing and even satisfying, good introduction for courses? One answer to this question is that in an age of global awareness, we, that is academics, are still using a Western ruler to measure the Russian state and its behavior. Our scholarly questions, setting aside the more explicable practices of the media, our scholarly questions are still posed from within a conventional Eurocentric frame. Backwardness has gone a bit out of fashion, but the categories of our inquiries are still fixed by the latest Western and often European and usually French and German style. Where is Russia's civil society? Where is its modernity? Where is its colonialism? Where is its law-based state? It seems impossible to explore Russia's social and political practices now or in the past without starting from a controversy, a theory, or an assumption from Western social science and without ending with an implied, implicit or explicit comparison with the West. But the world, and especially the historical world, the world before the 18th century and after the, 20th, after the 20th, is much more than the West. And this brings me to my cure for our imagined idea of normal and its misleading, if well-meaning, projections onto others. I suggest that one way to normalize Russia is to discard the blinkers of conventional Western historiography, 
with its fixation on modernity and the nation state, and to open up our eyes to the long-term history of empires and to Russia's place in this world. The empire effect sets both Europe and Russia into a more worldly perspective, enables a historical explanation of Russia's social and political habits, and helps us to see why there's really no normal there or anywhere at all. Why empire? Empire, why empire is a category for doing history, and why empires as in the plural as an approach to history. Recently, social scientists and humanists have started to re refer to something called the imperial turn, following up upon the linguistic turn and the cultural turn. These, of course, happened very strongly at Michigan and got a lot of attention here. Kimitaki Matsuzata's Slavic Research Center in Japan is now issuing volumes of what he calls comparative imperiology. This turning empire into academic convention sends shivers down my spine. I hate the conformity of schools and turns, and so why go forward with something that's soon going to be called empire studies and with all the dangers of conformity that this fashion will entail? Well, a first answer to these questions is there was something wrong with the earlier conventions both with the conventional interpretations of history and with the conventional categories used to investigate the past. To paraphrase Marx, and some people in this room will remember him, um, a specter has been haunting Europe, a specter haunting European history, I would say, and this specter is called the nation state. That's not Marx. Um, I learned in graduate school way back uh, in the 1970s that the 19th century was about three things. It was about industrialization, progressive politics, and nationalism, all leading forward to the better world of the 20th century and beyond. Now, since that time, scholars and others have complicated the stories of industrialization. They have gone sour on progress itself, but somehow the mystique of nationalism remains with us. The history of the world is still told today as a story of the emergence and formation of independent nation states. And this story and its imperatives are imposed on Russia and elsewhere. But this entrenched perspective on world history is not just Eurocentric, it is also wrong. <laughs> the idea of a long-term history from empire to nation state is a projection backward of a political vocabulary that really took hold only in the second half of the 20th century. Contrary to this idée fix, the most powerful political entities, straight through the 19th century, as well as earlier, and into the aftermath of the Second World War were empires. Let's just look at Europe in 1877 and what we see in terms of the kinds of polities, the kinds of countries, the kinds of states that existed. One strategy of many European empires in the 19th century, of France, of Great Britain, the German Reich, Reich, Belgium, Italy, and others, was to acquire, maintain, and extend colonies overseas. This phenomenon ultimately gave rise to a new academic turn to colonial or post-colonial studies. But while colonial studies is founded in large part on a critique of Eurocentric approaches, the project of post-colonialism itself replicates, reproduces Eurocentrism with the values upside down. Europe, from the colonial studies perspective, is no longer the source of progress in the world, but it is still Western Europe, Western Europe colonial powers that dynamize, and this time for the worst, um, world history. The other empires of the world, active in the same time, or the much more lasting ones, be well before the 19th century, are not part of the colonialism story. 
let's look at the 19th century in a, another form, the great leaders of the times, of the mid-century, or earlier, an earlier big empire, Napoleon. Okay, so the, a history of empires can and should be more worldly in its concerns. That's my argument. The topic and category of empire can allow us to be more inclusive in space, less Eurocentric, and more global. Because empires have been a force throughout most of human history, the study of empires enables us to escape the tyranny of the modern and analytic categories set in modern times and read back on earlier ones. Empires were a force for change and transformation of the world for millennia. Their actions, both within their realms and through their competitions, set the context for political action and ideas, including the actions and the, at the idea of the nation state and the actions of nationalists. So I can't talk about our whole book today. I am going to talk about Russia's imperial trajectory. And what I'm going to do now is sketch out an imperial framework for looking at Russian history. Two themes run through my account. One is the need to look at the long term. The European moment of world hegemony was short, two and a half centuries if we're generous. Russia's political formation began well before Europe became Europe, or a dominant reference. Second, the idea of transformation, my second theme. The capacity of successful empires to absorb and modify what Fred and I call imperial repertoires of rule. So Russia is a case in point. The repertoires of rule of different empires absorbed and transformed by other empires. So I'm going to make my case in the hard way. I'm not going to look at the imperial period um, technically defined from 1721 to 1917. I'm going to look at what became before and after this period. And even more daringly, as everybody who knows me knows, this is not my period of research. I'm going to look at two periods based on other people's research. So but I'm going to make my argument over the long term, uh, taking the pre, technically pre-imperial period and the post one to make my case for imperial transformation. Okay. While many might argue that uh, empire would be the appropriate focus of after Peter declared Russia to be one, be one in 1721 and through 1917, I argue that both imperial, inter-imperial connections and competitions before 1700 and the reconfiguration of the Russian polity twice after 1917 offer insights into what I would call Russia's long-term imperial habitus, European reference, Bourdieu, okay, but I think it works. A focus on empire allows us to situate moments of synthesis and transfiguration of Russia's evolving political culture and to envision a dynamic of uh, ongoing absorption and transformation of ruling strategies, a dynamic that continues to the present. So Russia before imperium, empire before imperium. Russia was not Valerie Kivelson is going to correct lots of this later, but here we go. Uh, Russia was not a blank slate for empire in 1700 or 1689. Peter and his advisors worked to expand an already imperial terrain, using tools honed over centuries of struggle for secure statehood. They conceived of their possibilities already from imperial perspectives. The context for imperial St. Petersburg was Moscow with its achievements, Muscovy. Moscow, its survival as a town, as a princedom, its, its expansion into a multi-ethnic polity. Before Peter's time, Muscovy had become an irritating challenger to the empires on its borders, China, Mongol, and other Khanates, the Ottomans, as well as a contender with Swedes, Poles, 
Baltic Knights, and others for imperial power in Central Europe. How did Moscow become a spreading center of empire? Is, this, is the slide visible enough? Uh, do you, I don't like to turn out the lights in the room. But, um, so here we have Moscow surrounded by imperial formations. How did, how did Moscow succeed? How did these principalities of Russia, as they are indicated on that, succeed? As potential builders of empire, princes in the Moscow region, unpromising in terms of natural resources, had at their disposal three intersecting political experiences. That of the Rus, that is, their progenitors, their dynast the dynasty in Kiev, whose empire had failed after a brilliant start, that of Byzantium, uh, the long-lived Eastern Roman Empire, and that of the sovereigns of the Moscow princes for two critical centuries, the Mongols of the Kipchak Khanate. <coughs> Moscow emerged as a budding empire. Oops. That's good. It's better? Okay. Yeah. As uh, its princes made choices from elements of these traditions, creating new syntheses and new ideologies of rule. Three elements of the Muscovite, of Muscovite politics became major lanes on Russia's imperial highway. One of these was the configuration of superior power, the imperial dynasty, inherited from the Rus and tweaked by the Muscovites into a long-lasting institution. The warrior princes who founded a state in Kiev gave Russia not just its name, but imperial charisma. The stage on which later scenarios um, would be played out was that of rule by a dominant member of the royal and only legitimate dynasty. In their capital, on the Dnieper River, the Rus princes had made themselves into a Eurasian-style ruling clan, ethnically and otherwise distinct from the Slavic peasants in the surrounding area and from the artisans who flocked from Central Asia and other places to their city. Their founding legend, recorded by Orthodox chroniclers later, it emphasized the advantages of rule by an outsider. I quote, Rurik and his brothers were invited by the Slavic tribes to rule their land and bring peace among them. The mystique of a ruler from a distant, distant place who was able to make and keep the peace remained an enduring element of imperial imagination in the area. Princely brothers were part of this picture, but so too were the gangs of armed men who supported each contesting prince in their fratricidal combats. If lucky, their followers, these followers made their way into the ruler's inner circle, the emperor, his family, his circle of his advisors. These were key elements of political power and authority. Another element of state building at the time was religion. The Rus had f at first took a promising polytheistic approach, incorporating and synthesizing Norse, Finnish, Slavic, Iranian deities. Vladimir's turn toward monotheism and Byzantine Christianity reminds us of Byzantium's visibility, imperial Byzantium's visibility, its example of imperial power enhanced by Eastern Christianity. The Rus choice for Eastern Christianity is a good example of an imperial strategy that had unplanned, long-term, and transforming consequences. This cultural acquisition remained in the imperial toolkit after Kiev's decline. In the 13th century, after the Mongols had dealt Kiev the coup de grace, surviv surviving Rus princes acquired a third imperial asset, probably the most important of their imperial acquisitions, a set of administrative and military te techniques for subordinating populations, for taxing them, um, and keeping subordinates loyal. The Mongols did not deign to rule the unpromising lands west of the Volga directly, but they sent out tax collectors who drew on local authorities to assist them. Based on their small towns, the Rurikid princes competed with each other to gain the Khan's favor to be granted the right to collect taxes and tribute, to marry into the Khan's family, and to become the grand prince over all the rest. And in the process, they learned how to 
rule dispersed populations and keep a good deal of it for themselves. Here, a picture of the presence of the Golden Horde. Now, Don Ostrovsky's daring study, Moscow and the Mongols, describes these practices in detail. The Mo Rus princes had to play by Mongol rules. Um, and eventually, they got the upper hand over other Rurikids and the divided Mongols and used their expertise to collect goods worth bringing to their Mongol overlords. For princes based in the Moscow area, a sparsely settled and not that productive area, acquiring the largesse to bring to their so overlords meant expanding from their Moscow base, bringing more land, rivers, people, connections to the north and later down the Volga under their control. The requirements of empire, the Mongol one, inspired imperial expansion by the Muscovites. Now, Ostrovsky singles out some key practices that the Muscovites learned from the Mongols. Among them are dual administration, um, non -over, yeah, overlapping, uh, but uh, areas of control over the military and civil branches, um, the Boyar Council that duplicated the Mongol State Council of dependent uh, intermediaries, the principle that all the land belonged to the ruler, the the Yam postal connection, communication station, stations, and a Euro Eurasian variant of military land grants and other mil military technologies. Now, another important imperial practice, part of the Mongol repertoire, was incorporation of other people's leaders into the new uh, elite serving the ruler. And the Moscow princes themselves seized on opportunities to marry up into the clan. Khan's uh, entourage, but they also peeled off top leaders from uh, the other side and powered them as subordinates. The Mo Grand Princes of Moscow took in Tatars, the higher ranking the better. And this tactic was particularly useful as Moscow began to turn the tables on the Mongol Khanates during the 15th century wars. The Muscovites practiced or managed religion with the pragmatic eclecticism of their Mongol overlords. So learning administration from the Mongols gave the Moscow princes a particular imperial toolkit with long-lasting consequences. Over the next two centuries, the Moscow princes expanded their control of people and resources in all directions, creating a multi-ethnic and multi-confessional empire. Tribes living in the core area were Finns, Slavs, and mostly pagan before their incorporation. At the very top of the social hierarchy uh, were, were, was very mixed in origin because so many Mongol and Tatar families had entered Muscovite service. Western, westward expansion brought new elites who had served Lithuania, another empire, and some of them were Ro Roman Catholics. With the conquest of Kazan in 1552, Moscow became even more diverse. So, conquest, tribute, exaction, taxation of the agrarian population, and control of trade gave Muscovite princes the makings of an empire. But could they keep control for more than a few, cent, uh, a few generations? And here again, Muscovites merged elements of the Mongol-style rule into a new marriage politics binding the Boyar clans to the Grand Prince. A council of Boyars collectively advised the ruler. Royal marriage with subordinate clans and occasionally with foreigners allowed Muscovite princes to consolidate themselves into a royal dy dynasty. And as the Kipchak Khans had done before them, the Grand Princes declared themselves masters of all the land of the expanding realm. But they handed out large part of it to their elites on the condition of loyalty and service. Elite servitors who received land and people on it from the Grand Prince were unlikely to form a united aristocracy. Patrimonial principles, the ruler's ultimate ownership of all resources and the conditional land grant, inherited from the Mongols and the Byzantines and recombined in Moscow's own way underlay Russia's kind of imperial government for most of its history. Gradually, Orthodox Christianity was turned into an ideology of Muscovite empire, offering connections between the court and commoners. 
And once Moscow princes seemed to have the upper hand among their rivals, Orthodox clerics arrived and tried to make the church a power behind the Moscow throne. Don Ostrovsky writes about the need then to rewrite Russia's past, to create what he calls a new virtual history for Moscow, and to efface or disgrace the Tatars and make a different connection to ba Byzantium. The Khan's overlordship that had been so critical to Moscow's success was turned through Christian ideology into the Tatar yoke. Churchmen created a more ge generous, glorious genealogy, claiming that the Muscovite grand princes received their authority from the Byzantine emperors, and that they were descended from the family of Augustus Caesar, a fine example of faking the past and transforming the imperial image. In 1547, Ivan, the terrible to you, took on the new title Tsar or Caesar, tying himself to the Roman past. But Charlemagne had done the same thing in 800, and so did Ivan's contemporaries, the Habsburg ruler Charles V, Sule Sultan Suleiman the Magnificent. It was ancient, imperial, Rome, not divided, quarrelsome Europe, that compelled political imagination in the 16th century. For Muscovite ideologues, the natural connection was to the Eastern Roman Empire. Tsars added the title autocrat to their, to their um, name from the Byzantine word for complete ruler. The Tsar's crown uh, was renamed the Hat of Monomach after the Byzantine Emperor Constantine Monomachus. But in fact, this crown was made in Central Asia and had nothing to do with Byzantium except for the effective disinformation campaign carried out by Moscow's clerics. Rus Russia's rulers continued to tweak the simulated transfer of church authority, but to suit themselves. Although the Metropolitan of Moscow was made a patriarch in 1589, the Tsar issued a new law co code claiming that describing the right of every subject to appeal to the Tsar for the protection of honor and well-being. The Grand Prince was becoming both Caesar and God's chosen intermediary. In the 17th century, the Romanovs took the control of the uh, church and its powers a step far farther when the Tsar dismissed an unpopular patriarch uh, whose reforms had divided the church. So let's take a look at Alexei Mikhailovich, uh, who's wearing the shapka, as you will, the hat. <laughs> The point of this overview of several centuries of Russian history from the Rus to the Romanovs is to underline the imperial context of Russian state formation. The state literally emerged from an unpromising space because a sequence of would-be leaders learned their statecraft through a series of imperial encounters. And perhaps the most outstanding aspect of Muscovite political culture was the capacity to draw in ideas and resources and mobilize them in new ways. The d dynamic of expansion into unlike areas, the charisma of alien rule, and an effective management regime made Muscovites very good at empire. And they managed to create uh, an empire in an area where no one else had really bothered to try. Well before Peter stepped on the stage, the Romanovs added Europe to this mix. Now, of course, Europe was not Europe in the 17th century, and the West was on no, one, no one's horizon. But Poland, Sweden, and Ukraine were very much on Moscow's mind at this time, and rulers had to make, had made way for artisans, clerics, actors, musicians, military men, people whose skills and initiatives affected the arts, army, organization, and administrative practices. But there was nothing novel or backward or strange about an ambitious emperor's efforts to acquire the military skills of rival powers. What was new in Peter the Great's time was that now it was states to the West that offered these advantages and attracted his attention. So one lasting result of Peter's successful educational and cultural initiatives was ideological, setting up in the minds of elite Russians the idea of an essentialized West and an essentialized Russia. This imagined West became the model or anti-model and the binary rhetoric of West and Russia blocked out the complexity of Russia's prepetrine imperial history for Russians themselves and for scholars studying them in their history. There he is in his Western outfit. 
Okay, so now let's skip ahead, two and a half centuries ahead, and look at the practices of empire from 1917 until the present. It is unquestionable that the creation of the first communist state in 1917 was an event of enormous importance for world politics and history ever since, although ever since is not too long in, long in historical terms. But what gave this state its structure, its institutions, its political culture? Certainly not an effort to replace an empire with a nation state. Rather, continuing in the Russian way of transforming political practices, the Bolsheviks did mix in another European set of ideas, set of European ideas. This time, these were ideas about socialist theory and politics. And the Bolsheviks mixed these in with their own assumptions about how to rule acquired in the last years of the Russian Empire, classically defined. And at an ostensibly revolutionary moment, the Russians had some, the Bolsheviks had something to work with in 1917. The experience of predecessor administrations in running a multi ethnic state and an approach to governments governance forged over centuries from the mixing and recasting of various imperial inputs. If we look at the results of communist construction rather than expressed intentions, large part of the large parts of the picture resemble the earlier imperial blend. First, the new state, and I'm of course leaping ahead to 1989 map because there have been so many transformations and mutations of this uh, scheme since 1917, the new state was multinational. Now this was not, it's hard to get back to this time, this was not an obvious political form for a supposedly united world proletariat. In no way a response to Lenin's own theories of capi capitalist imperialism. But the Bolsheviks variant on empire came out of a sustained discussion among socialists, socialists who lived in empires in Europe, <laughs> Um, and in their colonies about nationalism and empire. The Bolsheviks' approach also came from the Russian state tradition and from social scientists who were trained in Russia before 1917. This federal structure and the nesting of administrative units based on the recognition of ethnic difference were 20th century variants on managing a multi-ethnic polity. Now another aspect of the communist reconfiguration of power was the supreme leader and his ruling circle. Here older traditions quickly entered into practice, if not, not right away into ideology. Elites themselves, not just the masses, act in, in accord with what I call the imperial habitus. Lenin moves in, moved into the emperor's place without hesitation, and his successors, particularly the first one, only heightened the mystique of the all-caring, all-knowing, all-powerful emperor. The politics of Soviet leadership expressed other elements of the Muscovite tradition. The, the ruler was advised by an inner circle of high-ranking counselors dependent on his goodwill and dismissible or, or killable at will. The politics of the Boyer-like council was enacted with ferocity and charisma by the second Soviet great leader. Now, in Material matters, the communist state also replayed what I'm calling the Mongol, Eurasian, European, Muscovite principle that all resources, land, people, labor, knowledge belong to the emperor and could be manipulated by him. Bolshevik leaders resurrected in different versions the conditional land grant as well as forced and transportable labor for peasants and other workers, while resources were doled out and retracted in point-making ways to party and other managers in the multiple chains of command. Finally, the new state's elites included people from the empire's diverse ethnic groups like this one. Moving into the ranks of the rulers and out of the ruled could be facilitated by playing the national card, by becoming the rep a representative of one's people. Earlier studies of Soviet history accentuated the repressive aspects of Soviet power. Some more recent ones emphasize its affirmative qualities. But what may be missed is the extent to which all understood that nationalities had to be represented, and the real question was, by whom? So my point here is not that the Soviet Union is just like Muscovy, but first, that it was imperial, not national. 
and that is older politics of acquisition and transformation of other empires' practices was at work. Over the course of 74 years, Soviet leaders and followers produced new blends of old and new ways. The friendship of peoples was a Soviet contribution to imperial ideology, a flexible, feel-good, ritually rich representation of political community. The single-party state was a world-shaking mix of European-style democracy based on contested politi party politics with Russian Muscovite notions of personalized hierarchies of command. To what extent did this transmuted imperial politics enter the political imaginary of Soviet and post-Soviet people? The last part of my lecture concerns this. Of course, no member of the Russian political, managerial, professional, or artistic elite would say explicitly that her assumptions, her habitus, derived from a transmuted Eurasian imperial pathway. <laughs> The West, anti-West, European, Russian dichotomies still pervade the hegemonic discourse of elite politics. But one can reach ethnographically into a more popular milieu to dig out assumptions about the state and how it works. So here I turn to Nikolai Sorenchaikov's study of the most remote small people he could find in the late 1980s in the Soviet Union, the Avinki. Uh, this, his study reveals the deep penetration uh, of the ideas of the state and state or social organization that correspond neatly to the transmuted Eurasian Muscovite Soviet model. The Siberian Ivinki, straight through all the disasters visited on them, including attempted collectivization, deportations, repeated failures at provisioning, still maintained, as Soren Chaikov shows, a connection to the state. That connection had been first created centuries earlier when Russian fur gatherers entered this area and latched on to the Avonki hunting prowess using the mechanisms of rewarding their leaders. Each strong man among the Avonki tried to become an empowered prince of his group, and to do that he had to convince the elders of the community to follow him, hand over their furs. The later Soviet mechanisms were the party's leader and his top advisors replicated at the lowest level by the local party boss and his committee, structures that became part of 20th century, 20th century Avonki lives. Well, as we all know, the Soviet mode of production ultimately failed to produce enough for its princes. But Tchaikov argues that the Avonki discussions, even the Avonki discussions of lapses in allocations from authorities, only reinforced the orientation of politics around the state and its campaigns. The Avonki in the 1990s still saw themselves as subjects of a state that would continue to provide chances in various ways to become a prince. So now one other case study, and, and then I will conclude. What about settled people? Jessica Alina Pisano's study of land rights and their transformation in Russia and Ukraine after 1991 opens up another window on the political culture of people whose lives um, had been shaped by Soviet imperial politics. Alina Pisano discovered that there were, contrary to all nationalized expectations, there were no grand differences between the political, the uh, land allocation practices in villages situated on two sides of the Russian-Ukrainian border. Both the Ukrainian village and the Russian village acted in the same way, contrary to her hypothesis going into her research. But what were they doing? All actors, not just the bosses, let me just show the Soviet Union breaking up along an imperial template, by the way. It's related to the further, the earlier map. Um, so what Alina Pisano showed ethnographically that in a situation when people did not know what to expect, but land was going to be reallocated, all actors called upon or referred to the state's regulations as they tried to reclaim uh, or claim or property. Successive laws provided a field of claim making, reference, and for the ambitious, a way to pursue one's interest. The formal legalism of documents and permits uh, from early times, a co component of Russians, Russia's regulatory governance, is visible. But also, the state in which in which in both Ukraine and Russia, the two new states, was accessed and represented by a, an array of intermediary authorities. And these local officials were not challenged. 
They were turned to by all parties in their struggles over resources and rights. Personal connections with officials were essential and recognized by all as the way the state worked at a local level. And local powers could live off this inherited power. So the state, the Ukrainian state, the Russian state, in these local variants, was functioning through the allocation of rights and resources, and the principle that it was proper for the state and not an impersonal mechanism, the market, or a social group outside the state, an NGO, to decide questions about resources seemed to be respected by all. And just a sh brief look at an ephemeral part of the uh, revised Soviet economy. Land was at no point regarded by, uh, by people as a commodity that could be uh, or should be freely bought and sold by an owner. The allocation of land, according to one officially sanctioned rules, was a language of power shared by society and the state. An acceptance of the regulatory state, of local authorities as its agents, seeing the state as an appropriate allocator of rights and resources, including land, Thinking of reallocation and impermanence of rights and property as ordinary. All these qualities of post-Soviet civility are identifiable as components of the much earlier Muscovite synthesis, transmitted somehow over centuries into Soviet times and beyond. Post-Soviet land policy also an off offers a strong example of the transformation of other powers, outside powers, par practices. Western advisors thought Russians and Ukrainians were privatizing land according to universal, normal principles. But post-Soviet lawmakers themselves treated land from the beginning as something that did not belong to those who worked it or to anybody else in absolute fashion. I want to leave time for questions, so I'm going to just skip ahead, but I want one final point. If the underpinnings of Muscovite legalism with centuries of legal enhancements have endured so strongly into post-Russian, post-Soviet times, we might ask ourselves what went missing from earlier imperial ways. Well, in Soviet times, the obvious gap was religion, at least for a while. The Tsars had relied on orthodoxy as a primary ideological buttress, even as they adjusted its prerogatives and refined their control and inclusion of other re religions. The Bolsheviks knocked out this support for their rule for a while, probably to ill effect for them. But later they did return to an imperial strategy of bringing church hierarchs under official state control. After 1991, when the awkwardness of official Marxism and official atheism was gone, orthodoxy conveniently resumed its place as first among official religions, and former communists went conspicuously back to churches or, when appropriate, mosques, synagogues, and temples. Look at Kazan today. The Russian Federation thus took up the tasks, the tactics, the transforming capacity of Russian Empire. The polity remained explicitly multi-ethnic, retaining subordinated national territories, some nested inside each other as in Soviet times, such as Chechnya, Dagestan, the Russian con and also Kazan. The Russian Constitution of 1993 offered all republics the right to establish their own official languages. There are 15, I think, in <laughs> Kazan, <laughs> while defining Russian as the state language of the Russian Federation as a whole. The Constitution guaranteed the rights of national minorities in accord with international principles of human rights. But these, like all other rights, are interpreted in the Russian imperial style. As Vladimir Putin revised the techniques of patrimonial power, binding magnates to the state, the prerogative both the prerogative of autocrats and communists before him, tightening control of religion, religious and other social institutions, bringing the media to heel, transforming electoral process uh, into a sovereign democracy supported by a single power, compelling loyalty from the Federation's governors in his vertical of power, resurrecting the manipula manipulable dualism of state party, legitimate czar, real czar, and wielding Russia's prime weapon energy effectively in the international arena, Russian Empire reappears in another, in another transmutation on its Eurasian space. I'm going to make one final comment and conclude. 
This is more about Crease. Many of us who have spent our careers studying areas of the world participated in the battles over area studies that broke out in the 1990s. It is still an ongoing struggle in places with echoes and variants in many countries. The questions I raise about normalizing Russia have some implications for this time-consuming, not always productive academic warfare. I don't want to go back to the details of these conflicts, but it's important to remember that the 1990s was a time of struggle, particularly on the part of social scientists, to normalize scholarship on world areas by making specialists pose the same questions and use the same theories as did regular, ordinary scholars in a particular discipline, i.e., scholars who usually worked on the U.S. or Europe and used professional categories and methods developed in uh, their discipline's historical trajectory in Western academia. One of those results was to undermine knowledge of the world as essential tools of language study and social immersion were lost. Another was to go global, to imagine there was a single global social science, a universal way to do scholarship and universal phenomenon to observe. So my final point that I want to make with this glance backward at our own academic trajectory is that the choice between particularism and universalism was yet another Euro or Western-centric way to pose a problem. Scholars who want to integrate their studies of Russia, China, Africa, other world areas into scholarship do not have to accept these normalizing terms. Rather than seeing exceptionalism as some kind of abnormal way to understand society and politics, and uh, instead, and seizing, and rather than seizing upon the supposedly universalistic categories of Western social science and ethics, we need to make a different scholarly transit toward the acceptance of diversity of social arrangements in both time and space. Forsaking exceptionalism for diversity is the moral of my story, and I think empire helps us get there. Thank you.